How to find the dog you're meant to. A dog you mentory. Hi. When you get a dog, you're in for a decade or more of joy or frustration. The right dog can make your life great, but the wrong one can be a real burden. Though you're going to love him anyway, his behaviour can either fit in beautifully with your family or drive you nuts. And if he's healthy, wonderful. But if he isn't, he'll be faced with regular and massive vet bills for the rest of his life, which might be, sadly, rather short. So how do you choose? I'm a vet and a dog breeder, and I made this documentary to answer that question. In it you'll find advice from leading dog experts from around the world on what they think is important when it comes to choosing a dog. From choosing the right breed for you to how to find the right breeder. From making sure you can reduce your risk of genetic illnesses in your dog to picking the right puppy in the litter. And how to choose a good rescue dog, to how to raise your puppy right, so it'll be a fabulous canine companion for you. Getting a dog is a significant emotional and financial investment. You deserve a dog that's going to bring you joy and happiness and not be a burden on your family. You deserve one that's going to live a long and healthy life and not be sick all the time. So before you get your next dog, I urge you to watch a documentary. And I wish you and your new ideal canine companion many years of joy and happiness together. I mean, to rehome a dog costs thousands of dollars. You know, why don't we just put into that into an education program like, like you're doing with this documentary, telling mm -hmm. people that you don't get a good dog just by going to a breeder and buying a purebred puppy. Choosing a dog can be very confusing. The perfect dog for you is out there, but navigating your way around the bewildering array of choices is difficult. You're going to have your dog for the next decade or more. What if you choose the wrong one? For starters, out of the hundreds of breeds available, how do you know which one is right for you? And once you've got that sorted, how can you distinguish a responsible breeder who breeds puppies for lifelong physical and mental health from an unethical one who doesn't? Once you've chosen your breed and found a quality breeder, you're going to be faced with a swarming litter of adorable puppies. What should you be looking for? And when you take him home, what critical steps do you need to take in his first few weeks with you to give him the right start in life and realize his potential to be your perfect dog? This documentary was made to help you answer those questions and find your next ideal canine companion. Dogs serve uh, different functions for different people, but by and large, the greatest benefit, I think, to be derived from them is this social support function. We know that humans uh, need social support. We know that the people who lack social support are more vulnerable to becoming ill, for example, or developing heart disease, all these kinds of problems. And so it's very important for us to feel like we, are, we have that social support. And I think dogs are very good at providing that. No matter where you've got a gap in your life, you can slot in a dog and it can make you feel better. However, that doesn't mean that everybody should rush out and get a dog. Mm -hmm. Because when you do get a dog, you there are a lot of time and effort and energy. There's a whole lot of responsibilities that come with that. And they're good responsibilities if you can shoulder those responsibilities. But if you can't, it's not fair to put their welfare at risk because you are not the best owner you can be. I guess how to know if you're ready for a particular dog. I guess thinking about your life stage, as I mentioned before, and doing that research first, perhaps making sure you've got a bit of time off around the time that you get a dog and that your family is ready and your circumstances are ready. Sometimes you might choose that dog and you want it straight away. But there might be a six month wait list for the breeder. So planning ahead is really important. If you're an impulse, impulsive person, then I definitely suggest don't go to pet shops or places where you might be tempted 
to buy on impulse? They should first of all think about what sort of home they can provide. It's really hard for people to think 10 years in advance. Mm. So it's all very well to look at their life today and think this is my life today and I can fit a dog in. But how about 10 years from now? To firstly, consider before you even get the dog the reasons for getting the dog. Why you want a dog in your family. It's not a whim, it's something that you're making a commitment to. Obviously, you've got to take into consideration the rest of the family as well. Just because one person in the family wants a dog, you have to make sure everyone else in the family is also on the same page. It's really important that you're prepared for the dog, both financially, that you have the time, that you're mentally prepared. If you're not in the right stage of your life, then it might not be the right time to get that dog. Uh, are you living in the right style of house? Are your children old enough? Um, can you afford you know, the health care, the toys, the bedding, the training, which is critical? People need to be aware that getting a dog is a, a serious undertaking. It's not a trivial decision. And uh, unfortunately, quite a lot of people you know, it's a bit of a spur of the moment thing. You know, they think, oh, you know, look at that cute puppy and wouldn't it be nice to get a puppy? And they haven't really thought it through. They haven't thought about the implications. They rem maybe remember that, uh, you know, they used to have a dog when they were a kid or something, but they weren't looking after it then. It was the parents looking after it. So people tend to go into the whole relationship in a somewhat lighthearted way. And I don't mean to put people off owning dogs. I think it's great owning dogs, but it's a serious commitment and you shouldn't do it unless you know you've got the time and the resources and the ability to give that dog a, a reasonable quality of life and a good home and all these things. Owning a dog is just a wonderful thing, which I highly recommend, but if you choose something which is inappropriate for your lifestyle, it ends up being not an enjoyable experience both for you and for the dog. The whole key to enjoying dog ownership is to make sure that you choose something which is appropriate for your lifestyle and choosing well in terms of where you get that dog. Well, firstly, a don't. Don't choose a dog based on how the breed looks or a certain characteristic that you think the breed might have. You do need to have a breed that's suitable for your family, for yourself. Calm and friendly. So they want a dog that's safe with their kids. They don't really care if it's short-haired or long-haired or tall or short or fat or thin. Or... Those physical attributes people think are important and they are kind of important because you have to like how your dog looks, but they're less important over the long term than the dog's psychological and behavioural characteristics because it's really hard work to look after a dog that's not safe. We do have dogs that are better or worse adapted to living in the community that we've created. Some dogs don't belong in the world that we've got. Wouldn't it be true to say, James, that energy level of dogs is fairly predictable with breed and that people who can't offer a dog a lot of exercise or work probably shouldn't go for a working breed and things like that? Didn't Absolutely, it? yeah. yeah. Um, and very basic stuff like that. If, you, if you've got a breed like, a, I don't know, a Vizsla or something, a hunting dog, uh, that has tremendous amount of energy and constantly wants to be out there sort of hunting and foraging, then, yeah, you need to be an active person keeping a Vizsla in an apartment building and not taking it for, you know, walks in the countryside is probably a big mistake. Similarly, you know, I don't generally advise people to get border collies as pets because the, the breed has been bred to work. They like to work. They find work rewarding. And if you don't give them work to do, they'll invent strange things to do themselves. They become very sort of obsessive, compulsive, and they'll do the weirdest things just because they do feel compelled to be you know, busy all the time. If you don't have time to deal with an animal like that, to provide it with the outlets it needs to, to kind of express its inner drives, then you're going to have problems for sure. It's good to speak to both breeders, but also people that already have that dog. If you really wanted a particular breed of dog, if you don't develop it with the training, the socialisation, the trust, the development, it's going to be that nightmare breed of dog, the one that you see down the street and you think, I'm glad that's not my dog, <laughs> rather than the ideal dog of your dreams. There's a multitude of different dog breeds, uh, many, many, I think in excess of 250 or, or something like that. 
Uh, and that's not to mention all the crossbreds that you have, which are a combination of those, those breeds. Uh, you should be looking at your lifestyle and saying, well, there are a few things that you need to consider. Uh, size, you need to consider coat, you need to consider temperament, and you need to consider health. Uh, I think it's easier to, to break them into toys, which are very small breeds, then small to medium breeds, medium to large breeds, and then your giant breeds. So your toy breeds uh, basically become very popular because they are easy to fit into modern lifestyle. Very, very small apartments, uh, will, will, you know, small houses, small backyards. Because they've been, the breeds have been developed to be small, um, there's been a lot of selective breeding in toy breeds. So you are probably more likely to get uh, breeds which can suffer from genetic health disorders because along with the uh, combination of genes to bring down their size, you get a, a doubling up of, of negative genes. Um, if you're wanting an outside dog that you're gonna do a lot of, yeah, it's gonna spend a lot of time outside, then choosing a toy breed is probably not the, the sort of dog that you, you want. Um, the very fine coats can suffer from being from the cold very easily. They don't have a lot of body mass. Uh, long coated dogs get dirty, wet, uh, lead to all sorts of coat problems. There is the theory that small dogs are harder to train. Uh, studies have shown that it's really just people who don't bother to train them. <laughs> so they they're quite they're just as capable of learning to be good dogs as as larger breeds. With your small to medium breeds, lots of very popular dogs and very good dogs in the small to medium uh, breeds. Um, most of the time these days they're bred for companion uh, reasons, so their working heritage is not that important, but there are still a lot of working heritage uh, dogs in that category. So if we're talking about uh, Shelties, Corgis, they're all working dogs. Um, and therefore they still have relatively high energy drives. You can talk about Staffordshire Bull Terriers. A lot of the Terriers fall into that group. Again, their origins are in hunting, uh, so therefore they need to be occupied. They can be very hyperactive and strong-willed. Um, and so you need to have the time to spend uh, with them. Just, uh, just thinking that you're going to put it in a backyard and it's, and it's going to be a perfectly well-behaved dog just doesn't really uh, apply to any dog. But um, yeah, the, the one thing about purebred dogs is there is a certain amount of predictability about their temperament, so these sorts of things can be addressed. Um, so in your large to uh, medium to large breeds, your energy drive tends to increase uh, because these dogs were all built with a purpose. Most of them are hunting dogs, uh, working herding dogs, or protection dogs like Dobermans, Bull Mastiffs, and these dogs need to do things. They are not um, a, a dog that can just be forgotten about. You know, you need to have the time when you choose one of these breeds, you need to have the time to put into exercise, you absolutely need to have the time to put into training. Their additional size makes them potentially dangerous if they are not controlled. Uh, for instance, uh, a Jack Russell Terrier, incredibly high energy drive, can be quite uh, uh, tenacious. Um, but you can pick it up if it's a if it becomes a problem and wants to fight with another dog. You can pick it up when you get a large dog with that sort of drive. There's you, you need to be a very strong person to to control it. Some bigger dogs uh, are found the ones out there, um, you know, wandering, being you know not looked after. Uh, and smaller dogs, not so much. We we do get a lot of big dogs, you know, and I think again that reflects that big dogs need need work, you know, yeah, they're, they're just like everybody else and uh, once they get past that little cuddling stage, it's uh, a whole different ball game. And he's a Tenterfield Terrier cross and I heard that Tenterfield Terrier is a great family dog, which is what I really wanted and I didn't want something too big. I've had Labradors and Golden Retrievers before and, and they tend to um, require a lot of room and they like to dig holes. 
So I've had them before and I didn't want a big dog. I wanted a small dog. It's not fair having a big dog in a small backyard and he's, he's a good size. And then you get to the giant breed. You need to look at your home circumstance and say, if you have a tiny backyard, Great Danes can be a very relaxed breed, but the reality is they need to get out and exercise for their health for no other reason. So uh, they have, uh, many of them have a very high energy drive when they're young, they do settle down when they're older. But if you don't have the time and you don't have a, a large backyard, uh, and you can't cope with a large dog that's going to clear the table with its tail, um, then you really must, you know, have to be practical and say, do I really want a Great Dane? Uh, a lot of your giant breeds um, are droolers. Uh, they will shake saliva all over your house if you can't cope with that. Don't buy a dog with loose jowls because you're not going to be able to live with it. I realised what I was getting myself into, especially with the Kelpie. So I, I, um, a, I'm not a gym junkie, so I'd rather walk a dog. And uh, so I know that it's going to require a lot of um, fitness in, yeah. and that. So. Uh, this time next year, it might be a bit thinner. <laughs> um, so he's, yeah. he's kind of your um, exercise program on he is, he is. Thing. The problem people can make when it comes to coat uh, is very often with some of your more ornate toy breeds uh, is by choosing a dog because they like the way it looks in show coat. Nobody, unless you're showing these dogs, will put in the time that's required for a show coat. Uh, so you may as well look, if you're thinking about Maltese because they're beautiful, you need to go and look at what a Maltese looks like clipped off because I guarantee that that is what you're going to live with. So uh, you really need to look at coat maintenance before you decide uh, on a breed and be pr practical and decide that you really like the breed in its clipped off state because that's really the way it's going to uh, is going to look if you're going to choose a poodle or a poodle cross or any of those sorts of things you need to factor in the cost of grooming because unless you're adept with a set of clippers uh, and want to learn the task you're going to be paying for that uh, as well the reality is you need to factor in the time taken to groom these dogs um, and if you don't have the time for it or the money to pay somebody else to do it, then don't stay away from a dog with a, with a long coat. We uh, have had two German Shepherds and um, a Rottweiler Staffordshire Cross over the years um, and I never realised but I used to sneeze a lot around the dogs. I was never going to have another dog because once the dogs went I actually found that I stopped sneezing. So and you thought you had hay fever, yeah, but it was actually yeah. about the dog's yep, hair, yep. right? And uh, it wasn't until another day I started patting another dog of a neighbour's, which was a Staffordshire Cross, and um, I started sneezing almost straight away. Uh, I swore we were never going to have another dog, and then the wife and the granddaughter got on to me about it, and uh, so I started researching, and that's where we came across the Bichon, and uh, they're a hypoallergenic dog and all that sort of stuff and uh, I'd have no problems with her whatsoever. That's um, fantastic. And, uh, so, yeah, so it's been the right choice for us in that regard. So the whole quality of the relationship with your dog was changed by just yep. choosing the right kind of dog? Yep, yep right? that's right. Well, Arby's my first puppy, um, so I guess because I recently moved into a unit, so I had to get something quite small, um, and also I work normal office hours, so I've only ever had large dogs before, though, so I, I wanted something quite intelligent as well, because I have horses, um, so he needs to be uh, reasonably intelligent enough to understand uh, not to go under their legs and that sort of thing. So that's why I wanted a beagle. But then upon talking to people, um, they did say that beagles had uh, truckloads of energy and were a bit uncontrollable and possibly would just run off the lead and never come back. <laughs> so given that, I did a bit more research and I found out about the beaglia. Um, so, and it seems to work well because it's a, a cross with a cavalier. And that, I think, takes the edge off the, the craziness of the beagle. Um, so, but then again, it depends how much beagle at the moment he seems to have a lot of bigger <laughs> so um, 
but I'm quite overwhelmed at his friendliness because I have had larger dogs like and violent dogs before and it's quite different walking a friendly dog I don't have to worry about obviously muzzling him mm. um, and he's just a really sweet little pup and and when I go to work he understands that he has to be left for hours on end so and he's not too destructive actually for a beagle he, he likes to sniff um, so I hide treats and stuff for him uh, but he doesn't dig much so yeah I'd, do, I'd go this breed again I think so for their intelligence and their uh, I don't know ability to adapt and their friendliness. Um, well I guess I um, first got Millie off a breeder online so did a lot of research online. Um, I was specifically looking for something crossed with a poodle um, so I wanted non-shedding non for sure because I knew it should be a, an inside dog so that's sort of why I sort of looked at that sort of crossbreed because they had such a good good temperament um, and they were very good companions. So she's, yeah, miniature Labradoodle cross with miniature Labradoodle. Um, and I guess so far having her, I've realised that she's very, very energetic. Um, a bit more energetic than probably what I was initially expecting. Um, but otherwise she's, she's been really good. No, no regrets at all. Just looking at the different breeds and what they do in terms of herding or sporting dogs and hunting. Uh, um, all of these types of things. So these are all heritable behaviors and, and temperaments are heritable as well. And, and we see that as a difference between breeds um, as well. And some breeds have uh, behavioral traits that uh, can border on the unacceptable. Our goal is actually to breed uh, family pets. So therefore, things such as the length of a tail and all those sorts of things aren't as important to us. The things that really are important to us are healthy genetics, good temperament and also the fact that we're producing dogs that are made to fit in today's society. What we want to do uh, for, for our, our clients is, is breed a dog that's purpose bred to be a family pet and not for anything else, not to hunt ducks, not to hunt fo uh, deer or uh, round up sheep or cattle or anything like that. It's purpose bred for families to be a pet these dogs do go to the inner city so a cattle dog you know which is a lovely dog in the right place is not going to be appro appropriate in in suburbia you mentioned earlier about um you you'd done some looking into it and seeing the types of dogs that were ending up in pounds and shelters were generally and we've done our own research over the years and they generally are uh, what we would call accidental births so they're massive cross working dogs your labrador cross working dogs uh, Staffordshire Terrier crosses are well overrepresented inside in the pound. The, the typical rescue dog is often a mixed breed, and those breeds can vary. Um, you know, from crossy staffs to to Labrador crosses to you, you name it. We get we get every brand of of, of cross of dog, um, but also uh, you know we do get the pure breeds that are need work and need very, very good management, like, can I say, a Kelpie is a working dog and needs to be managed very well and needs work. It needs to get out and be active and have a big place to run around in. And, uh, you know, people underestimate sometimes the, the purebreds and, and the, the work that, 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 they, that they do need. In terms of the public deciding that they want the dog is choosing a dog that uh, fits with their lifestyle, fits with their environment. If they live in an apartment versus, a, you know, a large home with a large backyard, there are, are exercise and activity requirements. Uh, some dogs, if they if they aren't able to burn off energy, uh, develop behavioral uh, abnormalities and things. Uh, so, you know, someone that wants a retriever versus a, a terrier versus other breeds, there are different expectations of what you're going to get and understand that that's what you're going to get. And, and because there's certainly people that come in with their dog and they say, my dog is, you know, too high strung or too much activity or too much whatever for them. And they don't realize that that's what they were getting before they even made that purchase just by mm -hmm. picking that particular breed. Sure. And um, do you have um, anything you'd like to say about um, like contradistral forward breeds or brachiocephalic breeds, you know, push in faces, wonky legs, that sort of thing? Do you think that's an important consideration? Absolutely. So, so there are, you know, now we get into an area of, um, 
you know, we have, uh, through breeding, um, created uh, hundreds of breeds. And, and so one of the variations that we have are the, what are called chondrodystrophoid breeds. And so what these breeds actually are, are they are genetic dwarfs, and, and they have identified the uh, genes for those breeds, um, and, and they have created that as to become part of the breed standard. So when you have your basset hound, when you have your bulldog, you know, any of your long-bodied but short-limbed breeds is going to be a chondrodystrophoid or, or dwarf breed. And along with, with being of that type of, of dog, um, they are more prone to joint disease because it is more difficult uh, because of the abnormalities in the bones that has been bred for uh, to make sure that you have uh, normal joints that are not going to become arthritic later on and uh, that allow them to uh, to move and live freely because all dogs deserve to be healthy and deserve to have a, a, a long, healthy life. And so um, so it's important in these breeds that they are screening for hip dysplasia and elbow dysplasia and uh, patella uh, and um, luxation, slipping kneecaps and, and the different types of disorders that uh, um, that can plague those breeds. Dachshunds uh, particularly can have uh, severe um, back problems where they actually become paralyzed and, and so where they have a disc that slips out in their back. The brachycephalic breeds are the breeds with the pushed-in noses. And, um, and the issue with those is that... Um, is that they're uh, they're not able to move air through their their nose as much, and dogs do not sweat. They don't have sweat glands on their body, except between their pads. But that's really not a significant uh, part for them. So for them to dissipate heat, they have to pant, and uh, through the mouth or through the nose to be able to move air. And uh, and so that is an issue in many of these breeds. We see pugs and and bulldogs and and Boston terriers and all of the the brachycephalic breeds with the with the pushed in small heads um, with very tight nostril openings you see, and you can see it as a puppy and, and you know that they're going to have issues later on and, and not all of them are going to be passing out because they can and overheating because they can't handle um, the heat and and so forth but certainly uh, there is a portion that that will and it is something that we need to to screen against Where do we get our companion dogs from? It, it, I feel like there's no way anymore in our community to be a good dog breeder. We've kind of got this perception in our community that all dog breeders are bad. Our puppy farms are bad, and I completely agree with that. Puppy farms are bad, but that doesn't mean you can't breed dogs on a large scale well. We've said that you can't, you know, purebred dogs have all sorts of genetic problems and all sorts of hereditary illnesses so therefore purebred dog breeders are bad and that's not true either some of them are perfectly good so everybody's trying to do the right thing and then we have this thing about backyard breeders are terrible nobody should be a backyard breeder well if nobody's a backyard breeder and nobody's a purebred breeder and there's no puppy farms we have two dogs you know (laughs) and i find that really scary and the only people who are breeding are people who want to show their dogs and some of them are breeding wonderful dogs, but some of them are breeding wonderful show dogs who aren't necessarily wonderful pets. So, and the same, you know, if you're breeding dogs that look perfect in the show ring, often they are dogs that are a little bit anxious because they stand up and look bright and shiny and terrific for a judge to look at. They might not be the best dogs to be breeding pets from. Um, so a good dog breeder to me is somebody that cares about their breed doesn't want to see it end up in rescue, supports their puppy people. Uh, and, and that's one of the benefits of choosing carefully because if you buy a puppy from Impulse in a pet shop, for instance, and you have a problem with that puppy, the pet shop doesn't want to know. But if you choose a good breeder who's interested in their breed, who understands the uh, uh, temperament, health, coat, uh, and uh, genetic issues with the breed, most of them will support their puppy buyers. And so therefore, you need to be able to identify those by asking questions. So you need to ask your breeder, how do they keep their dogs? Um, see how they respond to their dogs. If they love their dogs, chances are they're going to be you know, very caring about where they go to. So you need to look at how they interact. Can they show you documentation uh, on the genetic testing. Uh, don't just accept the fact that they say that their dogs have been tested. Ask to see 
the the results. Where we are, anyone that is purposefully going to breed a dog has some responsibilities as to doing the the health testing and the quality control to try to ensure that uh, that we have healthy um, healthy puppies uh, for people to uh, to take into their homes and become members of their families. And, and as a practicing veterinarian, I see dogs from the time they come into their puppy visit to the time that they take their last breath and, and throughout their entire lives. And, and we deal with the, uh, with the, all of the things that, uh, that go on with them throughout their lives. And, and some of that is genetic disease that is preventable or could be preventable. And, and so it, uh, it does, uh, cause me pause to, um, to be dealing with that on a regular basis and, and saying, you know, how can we improve improve the situation and try to uh, um, to get uh, these dogs to be healthier. The quality control of genetic testing and uh, pre-breeding examinations by a veterinarian to check for uh, the common genetic disorders that we see all of the time, uh, as well as the breed-specific disorders that may be specific to an individual breed uh, that may have screening tests for them, uh, that these are not being done by breeders. And so that uh, so that looking for health-conscious breeders and, and trying to make it more of a standard where the public uh, is, you know, or one of the first questions they're asking is about health testing and health that does put pressure on the breeders and that will move, uh, move us towards much, much healthier puppies and healthier dogs in that way. Next step is where do you get your dog from? And our research findings suggest that that's a very critical decision and that if possible, if you're seeking a puppy, and in some ways that's a good thing, you should A, get it from a reputable breeder. And of course, the then question is, well, what's a reputable breeder? And that's a, a tricky question to answer. Generally speaking, a reputable breeder will be someone who is uh, really enthusiastic about their breed. They want to breed animals that are of top quality health-wise and behaviorally. And they will be the kind of breeder who will be concerned about you and your ability to look after their puppy because uh, they care about what happens to their puppies. The opposite would be the breeder who basically views the production of puppies like the production of livestock animals. He's there to make money out of it. Uh, and that involves a lot of things. It involves uh, very often he's got a centralized facility with small breeding cages where he's mass producing puppies. And then he will sell those puppies on to people and distribute them out to the pet stores, uh, wherever they're going to be sold. They don't really care about the quality of those animals, whether they're very healthy or producing healthy puppies. Uh, they're also wanting to wean them early. The age from six to two, eight weeks is very, very important for social interaction between the puppies and the litter. That's how they learn how to be social, how to interact, what to do, what not to do, with the mother there to guide them. If you take a puppy too early, they miss out on that crucial stage, that crucial learning. Also, taking a puppy very early from a litter into a new home, they can overbond with humans as well because they're replacing the human, um, replacing the mother with the human, and it can end up leading to things such as separation anxiety, a dog that's way too clingy as well. Now, in many countries there are laws, and including the United States, where, uh, strictly speaking, you can't sell a puppy that's less than seven weeks of age. But it's mm -hmm. very difficult for most retailers to tell how old a puppy is. So they are being sold puppies that are actually much too young. They're being weaned too early, and that has psychological effects on the puppy. They can scar those puppies for life. So they're exposed to all kinds of uh, uh, disease risks as well through this uh, mixing of, of puppies from different litters and different uh, producers. Also, these puppies are thoroughly traumatized. You know, they're being moved from place to place. They, they may be left on their own for long periods. They may be stuffed in crates with lots of other puppies for long periods. And then finally, they get into the pet store, and uh, the sort of role there is to look cute and appeal to somebody's sympathy. The other issue is we know that the, uh, the breeding animals are very stressed in this environment. And we know now that this stress especially for a pregnant female, the effects of that can be transmitted to the, the pups. Literally, it, it sort of can turn off the expression in, of certain genes in the puppy. So, so those puppies will then grow up to be expecting a highly stressful environment. 
And that's not the kind of puppy you want because it's going to be hyper-reactive and, and very difficult to manage, and it's going to develop a whole host of, of behavioral problems later down the line. So the, there are many, many reasons why you should not get a puppy that's younger than seven or eight weeks. Uh, you should not get a puppy from a, a retail outlet, if possible, because you know nothing about the history of that puppy, and it may have been bred in anywhere. This is now happening in the United States where people are importing these, these puppies from Asia where they are literally mass-produced in, in, wow. in factories. And if people want to end up with a dog that fits in harmoniously with their family, what should they do? You know, puppy classes are cool, but it's too little too late. We, we, I'm really trying to tell owners, when you buy a puppy, you better check that the breeder has socialized it house trained it, chew toy trained it, and manners trained it, and if not, find a breeder who has. No, what happened though? I, I don't care, breed or breeding, I don't care whether, whatever the breed, whether it's an Afghan, a Rotty, a Pit, or a Malamute, or a Bichon, or a Shih Tzu, I don't care whether it's been bred, the best kennel club breeder, or in a puppy mill. The, 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 the largest variable that influences the dog's livability is, was he socialized and trained before three months of age? Because I'm telling people, don't buy a puppy that's not house trained. It's mm -hmm. dumb. Don't buy one that's not chew toy trained. And especially for the puppy's sake and yours, don't get one that hasn't been socialized. Because, you know, if a puppy is anxious around people, his, his quality of life is going to be crap for life. Mm -hmm. And the owners too, because they can't invite people to the house. When they invite kids over, they have to put the dog away. They can't walk the dog. It's, it's a crying shame. And I, and I think it's the cruelest most inhumane thing we do to dogs that we don't socialize them prior to three months of age. We don't prepare them to live with humans. I mean, humans are difficult to live with. You know, how dogs put up with us, I, I really don't know. It's admirable. And um, failure of potty training is a really big issue, isn't it? It sort of can lead to all sorts of um, worse problems down the track and eventually the um, surrendering of the dog. Oh, yeah. I mean, no question about it. Really simple, predictable, preventable behavior problems are the number one terminal illness for pet dogs and cats. And it's so silly when something like house training is so easy and so effortless. All, all the breeder has to do is to set up the living situation so the puppies are in an area which is long and thin, so three times as long as it's wide, with a bedroom at one end. Um, and its toys and water supply, and then a toilet at the other end, and the puppy will naturally house train itself because it has three very strong preferences. One, to pee and poop as far away from the bedroom as possible. Um, two, they like to pee where they smell urine. And three, the substrate preference. As adult dogs, they like to urinate and defecate on the same ground surface that they did as puppies. The dogs need to be handled and the puppies need to be handled every day from birth and um, our puppies are handled twice a day. They also need to be set to daily activities, e.g. Um, noises that go on around the actual environment, e.g. you've got puppies that are going into homes at eight weeks old that may have never heard a vacuum cleaner. So it's mm -hmm. important to absolutely to submit those the puppies whilst developing to loud noises, to different fabrics, to different toys, to different stimulants, to different enrichments, young children, older people, all those types of things. What about people who are thinking about taking on a rescue dog? Have you got any sort of tips for them? Mm -hmm. I think what I tell people there is, you know, well done. That's, um, you, you've, got a, you've got a big heart and I'm, I'm proud of you. But... Don't choose with your heart, choose with your brain. And it's basically you select and select and select. The right dog, the perfect dog is out there for you, but you've got to find him. And you've got to make sure the whole family is in agreement. The whole family chooses the dog. And by whole family, I don't just mean people, I mean resident dogs and cats too. So uh, look, the advantages of, of getting a, res a rescued dog, particularly if you don't want a puppy, is that uh, a lot of them have gone through the puppy stage. Uh, you, you get them very well um, med you know, medically looked after. They've been microchipped, sterilised, vaccinated, you know, you know all of that's good. 
Uh, and, and also you'll find often that the rescue uh, dogs are just looking for love and they give back in spades, if that makes sense. All dogs give back, but um, some of the stories we've seen from these rescue dogs who've had such a, a tough start uh, to their lives, it's you know like they've landed in heaven and, and what they give back is absolutely enormous. If we go through a fairly extensive assessment process with potential adoptees and that involves uh, understanding uh, what their work life is, what their home environment is, uh, whether they'll be able to have a dog inside, uh, how often they can exercise the dog, what that will be, um, checking out their fencing uh, in terms of security for the dog and also enrichment for the dog, what, what sort of extra special things are they going to do to help, to help the dog adjust to their, to their home. We do ask, uh, particularly in the first couple of weeks, that there is somebody around as much as possible to enable the dog to become comfortable uh, in its new space and comfortable with its new people. Uh, we, we also look at the temperament of the dog. We try to understand what the uh, potential adoptees are looking for in a dog, uh, including whether the dog is friendly uh, to children and what age range uh, the, the children are from, from very young to, to older. Uh, we, we also look at their lifestyle. Are they very highly active people or are they older and more sedate? Because you know, if you've got a very active dog who needs a lot of exercise, and you have people who aren't able to provide a, a huge extensive amount of exercise, well obviously you're probably going to have some, some issues with a match. So we're really looking at the whole lifestyle, the home environment, uh, the family, what, what makes up the family, plus friends too. You've got to be, be very aware that if you have friends visiting, um, they might have small children, they might want to bring their dog, um, all those sort of things have to be taken into account. We also do, uh, if they have a, a dog themselves, we do a dog meet. Uh, to ensure that uh, the, the dogs can socialise together and we do cat meets as well. So sometimes you'll find rescue dogs have been surrendered for a reason. They may have, uh, something has happened in their life or they may have a behaviour problem that's not been disclosed when they've been surrendered or it could be that in the first place the dog went into the wrong family. The family didn't train them, didn't socialise them and as a result had problems. This dog has not had the groundwork that's been done and if the groundwork's not being done those problems are harder to resolve. People need to be aware that they need to be that little bit more experienced taking on a dog knowing that that dog might have what we call baggage or pre-existing problems that are not always obvious at first. So it is quite important once again to do that research and make sure that those people are perhaps experienced enough to take on a dog and also are they willing to work with that dog when problems arise. Often uh, they're in here because they have not been um, uh, part of responsible dog ownership in terms of their previous families and uh, we require many of our dogs to have mandatory training so when they are adopted that's part of the process of um, actually letting them go uh, to, their, to their new forever home. Um, but the next time we got a dog I wanted to rescue a dog because I was really aware that there was a lot of dogs out there that needed a good home um, so I spent a lot of time on the pet rescue site looking for I guess the perfect dog and I met Skylar and fell in love with her. But I was told from the lady who had her for a few weeks that she was a gentle, loving little girl and that she would probably be a perfect fit for us. And as it turned out, she, she is. She'd escaped wherever she'd come from. She was neglected mm -hmm. um, and very, very timid. Mm -hmm. So we've been working with her, we took her home. She wouldn't even walk, you know, 20 meters. Wow. She was that fright. She was frightened of her environment. She was hypersensitive. Um, she still has the submissive urination problem when she meets strangers. It's the first time she'll do it. So we're still working on that. So <laughs> you've actually taken her on knowing that she needs training, knowing that you need to work socializing her and doing all that. Yeah. That's what you've been doing? Exactly. Yeah. Having said that, I didn't realize how much work it would actually be and you know we're still in the early stages but yes. we can we can walk we run now we play wow, that's a big um, change in eight massive, weeks isn't it massive sometimes there's a bit of a honeymoon period with a dog where they um yay i'm out of this shelter i'm in a home and um everything's going fine and then and then they sort of realize oh okay this is it and suddenly others other behaviors might exhibit 
Um, so our trainers uh, are available to go out to um, home visits um, and to help uh, help you know the new adoptees with any issues that uh, may may arise. Okay, the reason why we chose a rescue dog uh, was because I didn't want to start off with a, a small puppy. Um, we were looking for a dog around the age of 18 months. Uh, um, the thing is with a, with a rescue dog, sometimes you quite often don't know what the history, the past history has been and it can sometimes be a little bit um, challenging finding out what, you know, what sort of experience the dog had mm. previously. Yeah. Um, with my dog, um, we did have a few ups and downs with him initially in the beginning, but he very, very quickly settled. Well, being a, a bull terrier cross, um, he's a very wolf, willful dog, a uh, very loving dog, very, very um, protective as well. Uh, we found that he was always you know, barking at anybody that walked past, not just barking, barking, just ferociously barking. Mm. But it did take a couple of months for that to settle down, for him to trust people mm. and uh, even to trust family that used to come and visit over. Mm. Um, but with rescue dogs, you've got to make sure a lot of people do frequent the place so they do get used to you know, a nice family atmosphere. Sure. Um, so he responded to that and Extreme. calmed down. Very much and so. then what did you do? Anything else to sort him um, out? I just did basic training with him at home, mm -hmm. um, just the general basic training that I could do. When I had exhausted those um, avenues, I decided to come to uh, formal training. Things that we're both we're both learning, not just the dogs and myself as well. And um, it's actually you know, um, giving us a good bond together. In a sense, every dog you get from a shelter, you should take on a trial basis. Most shelters mm -hmm. will take a dog back if it becomes a huge problem. And I think when you adopt a dog from a shelter, you should be aware and open to the possibility that this won't work out. It might not work out. That this dog may mm -hmm. suddenly reveal aspects to its character or its personality that you had no way of learning about in the shelter environment. And then when you bring it home, you do exactly the same with it as in my puppy books long-term confinement, short-term confinement, errorless house training, you know, chew toy training, teach the banners quickly within a few days. Because when dogs change environments, they're very, very receptive to learning new rules. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure you know beforehand what you're going to do the first week the dog's home and you do it all. No mistakes. And, and then the transition can be you know, very easy. A quote from Frederick Douglass, and it says, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And I think we can really apply this. It's, it's easier to build strong puppies than to repair broken dogs. Um, have you got anything to say about um, inbreeding or line breeding? Um, I give seminars on selective breeding um, and breeding and... Uh, I am shocked and appalled with how little dog breeders know. I would not breed daughter to father, daughter to uncle, daughter to grandpa. That is inbreeding, inbreeding. And that's mm -hmm. what's caused all of these health problems. Because we haven't checked out our studs properly, and then we bred them too much, and we've spread this gene all through the breed. That is inbreeding. It's bad. It's disgusting. Disgusting. Mm -hmm. Disgusting. Yeah. And, mm. and and situations like the work would be, you know, it's hard to find a Dobie who's got a heart, who's going to live past seven, or a Golden that won't get cancer, or a Boxer mm. or a Chape, you know, uh, that has a life expectancy. But Cavalier King Charles, I mean, they're lucky if they make three. There's the whole other aspect of breed differences, which are the health problems. Now, that's a huge topic um, and a very difficult one. Um, Every, pretty much every time I talk to the owner of a purebred dog these days, the first thing they tell me about is all the health problems they've been having with that. And, and it's getting completely out of control uh, because the breeders, unfortunately, are breeding for the look of the animal and they're not breeding for the health and the welfare and the behavior. And um, it's a big problem and it's getting worse. Yeah. I know a lot of them are very defensive about line breeding, in breeding, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. But, you know, so many of these breeds are bred from a very small founding population of dogs, very tiny. You know, a dozen or a few dozen dogs represent the whole founding population. And then they practice things like breeding from champion sires, 
but very small numbers of champion sires. So again, that tends to concentrate the gene pool. And when you do that kind of thing for a long time, you're going to get problems. It's just inevitable. I mean, they shouldn't be breeding fathers to daughters and mothers to sons and brothers to sisters the way they do because, mm. you know, obviously we know that from, from human beings. It's not good for you if you do that kind of uh, incestuous breeding all the time. Because if you're buying a puppy, and it remains the case that most people want to buy a puppy, in which case they should meet the parents. And if you can't meet the parents... If you wouldn't want to live with the parents, you shouldn't be buying the dog. So mm -hmm. meet the family, meet the breeder, talk to them, get to know, you know, talk to other people who have got puppies from them, those sort of things. And even then, you can't be guaranteed you're going to get the best dog ever because there's all sorts of things that can go wrong. And But you, you try to minimise your risk by being smart about it. But that's what I'd like to do. I'd like to see more dogs tested for their behaviour and for that to be part of the choices that people make in terms of breeding them. And, you know, lots of breeders do that already, but I'd like to see it done more formally and objectively. Some breeds have uh, behavioural traits that uh, can border on the unacceptable, and for uh, many of those breeds, they do temperament testing of puppies, and they do temperament testing of the parents as well, just as any other kind of genetic screening um, that is done uh, for other disorders, because the behaviour is a, a, an essential part of, of what the dog is, and, and you don't want to have aberrant behavior or behavior that goes outside the, the bounds of, uh, of what is acceptable to us. Pick in a litter, you know, is it, can you actually tell which puppy is going to be most suitable for you or does it really not matter? As a general rule, you can tell different personalities by viewing the way they interact with each other in the litter of the various puppies that are there. The puppy that runs at you and jumps all over you, although it, you might interpret that as, oh, it loves me, it's friendly, that puppy is very bold and it can end up being quite a dominant dog because it's the one that ran at you. But then again, you don't necessarily want the one that's hiding in the corner, shying away from you. What you want is the puppy that's sort of in the middle. So that energy is a lot more balanced in that dog. So it's not too fearful, but obviously it's not going to be too dominant as well. It's a bit of a guide as well to their energy levels when you view them in that sense. Well, I mean, breed, breed differences in behavior exist. You know, individual differences within breeds are, tend to be greater than the average difference between breeds. So, yes, some breeds will present you with a higher risk of certain types of behavioral problems. But even within the worst breeds, you'll find uh, a lot of individuals who are perfectly fine and aren't a, aren't a problem. It's a, a probability thing. If I was choosing a puppy, I'd want something that was a bit calm, that wasn't hyped up. And even though the hyped up ones are really, really cute, mm -hmm. something that's a bit calm is probably a good thing. And, and you, you, so um, you, you kind of, as a breeder yourself, you notice that in even within a litter of the same breed, you're going to get some puppies which are really boisterous and energetic and and um, extroverted, and some shy puppies. And in the middle, the kind of calm, kind of um, not so in your face, but maybe a really well-balanced puppy that would suit most people. Yep. Um, so the research is not very convincing. However, I'm convinced that we can. So as a breeder who sees a lot of puppies and spends time with a lot of dogs, I'm absolutely convinced that there are temperament differences in puppies from the minute they're born sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, the way that they wriggle is different. The, what, the How they push into their mum is different. And I think those be behaviours are reasonably consistent. And I'm pretty sure as a breeder that I can tell my puppies at seven or eight weeks, I, I can help them fit into the right homes. Um, and, of course, you know, like you said, once people take a puppy home, what happens to it then has a huge impact. It is brainlessly simple, like falling off a log to raise a puppy so he's going to be bomb-proof and trustworthy with people. But breeders aren't doing it, owners aren't doing it, and vets aren't telling them to do it because they don't realise it's so important. So if you get a dog from a good breeder and you do the research and you know you've got the right breed of dog for you, you're on the right track. The next step 
is to make sure you've got that early learning experiences and the early learning environment right for that dog. So you may wish to take time off. I'm not saying take time off and spend 24 hours a day with a dog because a dog or a puppy needs to have some independence and need to be taught that. But you can do that the right way, especially if you're educated through going to puppy classes. But those early learning experiences are critical to shape the dog as it gets older. So puppy classes and socialisation. And we're not talking about just socialisation with other dogs. We're talking about socialisation with people, but also getting the dog to develop a bit of resilience in its environment. So getting used to traffic, different people, um, umbrellas, everything like that makes a big difference towards that conditioning and that socialisation of a dog. Probably right from the age you get it. The critical socialisation actually starts at four weeks of age. So the breeder has played an important part and that's also why it's important to go to a good breeder. You need to be able to have the time to commit to getting a puppy. It's not just something that you can have and put away when you need to go out or if you're tired or sick, you have to be able to have that time to spend with the puppy, make sure they integrate into the family the right way from the very beginning as well. So how much time are you talking about and when is the most important time? I feel the most important time is from the moment you pick the puppy up, making sure that your first interactions with the puppy are the way you want it to continue. Obviously, when it comes to things toilet training, you do have to be around to help the dog learn to toilet train. It's not something they will naturally learn on their own. You need to be there to encourage them, take them out regularly. And obviously feeding as well. When it's a young puppy, if you're away at work all day for 10 to 12 hours a day, they need to be able to be fed regularly as well. Mm -hmm. A puppy from 0 to 18 weeks, that is the most crucial part of their life. And it's from the day they are born to the day they are handed over to their new family and how that family is guided with the training, with the enrichment, with the support yeah. to be prepared. They yeah. need to understand that this little puppy is not going to come in bomb-proof. Yeah. You can't just stick it into a lounge room full of children and it's going to sit, drop, stay, roll over and keep you entertained for the next 15 years. It involves care, it mm. involves time, it involves training, it involves patience and that doesn't happen overnight. In regards to puppy training and early development of the puppy, what you do in those first few months is really critical. It's in regards to that socialisation, what you're doing is you're building on those foundations for the dog. A dog that is well socialised from a young age and socialised safely and that you've built trust with that dog is much less likely to, de to develop behaviour problems. For example, inappropriate behaviours around other people or other animals. Um, less chance of alarm barking, uh, destructive behaviour. And Dr Dunbar, what, what should people do when they get their puppy home? And what, What's the best way to set that puppy up for success and harmony in the family? Well, the, the most important thing is, is to carry on as the breeder should have done. Now, if the breeder hasn't done all this, if they haven't socialised, then that is a real emergency. I mean, you've only got four weeks to do it. You know, the critical period of socialisation really closes down about, you know, 12 to 13 weeks. So they've got to get 100 people in this house handling the puppy, cradling it, cuddling it, examining it, restraining it, uh, training it, come here, sit, lie down, roll over. We need men, we need children, and we need them quickly. Or you're going to have a big problem. But the, the, the unusual thing is that people don't see the problem until much later because the effects of insufficient socialization will not become apparent until the puppy is, say, five to eight months old. Um, at two, three, four months, the puppy looks Mr. Sociable and really confident. But the damage is done, and, and of course, fears and phobias naturally don't develop until later in life. And, and so the puppy first becomes shy and wary, standoffish, and then fearful, then reactive, then aggressive. And by the time the owners notice they have a problem, it's too late to easily do anything about it. So that's the most important thing, that regardless of what the breeder has done, make sure you socialize the living daylights out of this puppy and you do it totally safely at home, invite people over, you have parties every night, men one night to watch a ball game on telly with beer and women <laughs> another night for you know, good conversation and white wine and chocolate or, or vice versa depending on what your customs are in Australia and then children and you know I, I want the puppy to grow up so that he's, he's never going to feel wary or anxious around people because that's a miserable life for the puppy and for the owner 
Then the basic behavior problems, long-term confinement, short-term confinement. So the pup is always confined if the owner's not watching it. The biggest mistake that owners make, I think, is they give too much freedom and too little supervision. So the puppy makes mistakes. And every mistake heralds another 10 coming. So you want to make sure that house training is errorless, chew toy training is errorless, you know, and this is preparing the puppy for being left at home alone. I mean, in a nutshell, the best advice, I, I find this information so important. I wrote a couple of books, and they're available for free download at um, dogstardaily.com. And so download the books, they're free, follow the instructions, and don't yeah. make a mistake. And, and I tell people, you know, keep it up until that pup is at least six to eight months old in terms of the behavior problems, you know, excessive barking, destructive chewing, house soiling, and what have you. And then you know, the adolescent dog has pretty much got it. In terms of socializing with people, you, you never give up. You, you never give up. Um, so we highly recommend that you get into tra a training regime as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And training a puppy from very young age means that you can more likely prevent behavioural issues later as well. So those early weeks with the puppy as they integrate into your family, setting the rules and boundaries of how you want them to continue as well is very, very important. So a puppy that's jumping up, mouthing, biting might be cute when they're eight weeks of age, mm -hmm. not so cute when they're a lot bigger. Mm -hmm. So giving them attention when they're doing those behaviours as a little puppy, especially children like to play with puppies the wrong way, and that can encourage behaviours when that dog's a lot bigger and it's jumping on the children, it becomes a big issue. So making sure that you've got the time to supervise what behaviours you want to encourage with your puppy as well, making sure that the family members are interacting the right way. Socialisation with children, I guess that's really important if you don't already have children in the house, but it's also important that if you do have children, that the puppy or the dog is also socialised with other children outside the family. If you have children, then it's not just about teaching the puppy to be appropriate, it's also about teaching the children to be appropriate. And that's not always possible for a two or a three year old child, they might be too young uh, for you to, to, to get a dog or if you do you have to manage it very carefully and supervise very closely. Socialisation with children is critical because even if you don't ever plan on having children in your family, the dog is going to meet children and the typical things that children do is they run around and scream, they run up to the dog, can I pet your dog? They might come in close and want to cuddle your dog or grab the dog's collar or pat it in a funny way and if a dog's not used to that they're more likely to react out of fear. Sometimes a dog will, or a puppy will growl because it's frightened. And instead of, you know, sometimes people will they'll tell the puppy or the dog off for growling and the puppy learns, well, I just won't growl. But then they go to the next level if they feel really threatened, then the dog can bite. Things have changed. Dogs are a great part of our society now. And to be well socialized and to be well behaved they need to come indoors as well and be a part of the family. Said once people take a puppy home, what happens to it then has a huge impact. So, you know, p people should be encouraged to not just play with their dogs. Playing with their dogs is important, but having their dogs sitting by their side being calm is probably more important because that's what you want your dog to do most of the time. And we see a lot of things where people don't contact us until months down the track that they've put up with these bad behaviours until finally something happens, it's the last straw call in the dog trainer or else we're going to rehome the dog. And obviously the sooner you can get on top of issues, the better. Training from a very young age is really important to prevent those issues coming up in the first place. We can start doing formal training with the dog anywhere from about 12 weeks onwards. But obviously training in the home starts from the moment that you get the dog. So teaching the dog the rules and boundaries of what's acceptable behaviour, what's not acceptable behaviour. There's also puppy preschools out there, which is great for socialisation, but once they get to a certain age, formal obedience training helps you because not only do you have a dog that will learn to sit, drop, stay, etc., and be well behaved when you're out in public, but it also teaches you how to have control around the dog just in everyday life around the home. So say visitors come to the door, instead of having a dog that runs up and jumps all over them, you know how to get your dog to be nice, calm, relaxed dog, even to the point of into a drop and a stay so you can let visitors into the house if your dog's not going to jump on them or try and run past them and escape out the, out the door and down the road as we a lot of that happening as well. Yeah, so you're talking about um, people setting themselves up to have a fantastic relationship with their dog instead of the opposite. We deal with a lot of puppies or young dogs 
Um, they reach eight to ten months of age. They've never been around other dogs or they've hardly ever seen a dog. Mm -hmm. So the owner wonders why the dog's pulling them across the street to get to another dog. A lot of dogs are scared of vehicles, especially large noisy vehicles such as buses and trucks, skateboards, bicycles, prams. Um, dealing with a dog the other day where the owner told me her large dog went to jump up at a pram because they'd never seen a pram before. Mm -hmm. They didn't know what was in it. Um, they didn't know what it was, saw it moving mm -hmm. through the park, something on wheels, making a noise. Um, they wanted to go and investigate. So socialisation is probably one of the biggest issues mm -hmm. that is neglected by dog owners. Mm -hmm. um, and again, dogs need lots of physical and mental stimulation all the time. Um, as somebody wisely said to me once, fish swim, birds fly, dogs walk. Live on large properties where they'll have a dog roaming the property, they consider that that's enough exercise for the dog because it's not limited by space. There is no um, substitute for putting a dog on a lead and training and walking with it. It does need that physical and mental stimulation outside of its own property mm -hmm. um, because otherwise they either become stir crazy or again they're not properly socialised with other people and other animals. Um, early puppy training in regards to house training. Uh, puppies learn location and substrate preferences between seven to nine weeks. So it's quite important for new puppy um, families to realise that right from day one they need to manage the puppy's behaviour very carefully. And giving the puppy too much freedom in the house is asking for problems. Set your dog up for success. Have them in a puppy pen that's within the family area where you can keep an eye on them. You can take them out as needed and that would be after eating, after sleeping and after playing. They're probably the most important times but also learning to observe your dog. If they start sniffing around and circling, time to quickly call them outside and take them to the area that they need to go to the toilet. I think, the, and that comes down to people having that time in the early period when they get their dog to watch the dog, observe the dog, and give that dog, dog time to learn what is appropriate. How do people learn how to do all this stuff? Education. <laughs> people need to self-educate before they get a dog and it's really, really important before you even bring a puppy home to understand what's involved with dealing with a puppy, how to be the right sort of leader to your puppy so that you're giving them the rules, boundaries, the guidance that they need to be, become a well-balanced, happy, social dog. The whole community needs to look at is more education available for responsible dog ownership right from young people through to, through to older people, so starting in schools. Owning a dog is a very, very big commitment. It's like having a child. And you have to be prepared uh, to look after that dog like it is a child, uh, feed it, exercise it, ensure that it's clean and it has the right environment to, to nurture in. And I think you know a lot of people pick up that fluffy puppy and think this is wonderful and then come six months time and that fluffy puppy is chewing, um, destroying gardens, uh, doing, doing house remakes and uh, suddenly the novelty wears off and then it becomes a much harder uh, task and, and I think a lot of the time that's where people come undone in relation to dog ownership. Puppies have to start puppy training at a young age and uh, they need to continue that training right through until you know they, they understand that they're, that they're part of the family and not trying to rule the family but they're a family member and uh, how to live in a family environment and in the community as well. Congratulations! Now you know the five crucial steps that will lead you to your perfect match canine companion. Pick the right breed. Find a good breeder. Choose the right litter. Select a puppy with the right personality for your family. Set him up for a successful life with you by investing time at the very start for socializing and potty training. Are you ready for your perfect dog? You can get started right now by taking the free dog breed quiz at www.perfectmatchpuppy.com where you will also find heaps of helpful information to guide you.